In the years following the first sack of Rome, Gallic parties would often venture south in hopes of easy riches, but they were seldom successful. During one of these raids, an unnaturally large Gaul stepped forth and challenged any Roman to single combat. A young soldier, Marcus Valerius, descendant of the famous Publicola, stepped forward and accepted the challenge. But before the battle could commence, a raven landed on his helmet. A more obvious summon from the gods couldn't be asked for. With the bird's help, Valerius effortlessly defeated the Gallic champion and led the Romans in a comparably easy victory against the rest of the barbarian host. From this day forth, he would be known as Corvus, meaning raven. Such a claim was won on that day that the very next year he was elected consul, despite his young age, being only 23 at the time. Impressive start to a career that would consist of six consulships and two dictatorships. Italian geography is dominated by the Apennine mountain range, stretching down the peninsula. These mountains were inhabited by hill tribes, speaking the Osco-Umbrian family of languages that were related to Latin. Starting in the 5th century BC, the tribes began abandoning the mountains in search of fertile lands near the coast. There they came into contact with the Greeks and the Romans. In 334 BC, an army from Epirus was sent to aid the Greek colonies of Magna Graecia in repelling the Lucanians. Interestingly, only 60 years later, another army from Epirus would cross the Ionian Sea to aid the colonies, this time against the Romans. But we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves. Of these hill tribes, the Semnites were by far the fiercest. Most historians believe they originated as an offshoot of the Sabines. When they first started venturing south, they signed a treaty with Rome in order to deal with their common enemy, the Volscians. While the Romans were consolidating newly won territory, the Semnites started making forays into Campania. Life on the fertile plains made Capian soft, and they were no match for the battle-hardened tribesmen. In 343 BC, the Capians requested help from the Romans, but being bound by the treaty, the Romans were unable to assist. Seeing there was no other way, Capua and the rest of the cities in Campania formally surrendered themselves and their lands to Rome. This was, and still is, some of the most fertile land in all of Italy. With Campania under Roman control, famines that were so prevalent during the early years of the Republic would now be a thing of the past. The Senate realized they can't just pass up this golden opportunity, and they accepted their surrender. Envoys were sent to Somnium to inform them of these new developments and request that Semnites abstain from encroaching on Campanian territory. The Semnite court laughed at this request and, adding insult to injury, they ordered a raid on Campania in front of the envoys. When the news of these events reached Rome, war was declared against Somnium and two armies were levied. The first led by Marcus Valerius Corvus encamped in Campania, and the second led by Aulus Cornelius Cossus marched into Somnium. Valerius was the first to make contact with the enemy. Before the battle, he gave an impassioned speech, proclaiming that he wasn't elected to be their leader due to his famous ancestry, but due to his great skill in combat. This emboldened the men, and they engaged with great resolve. The fighting was fierce, as neither side would give any ground. Seeing there was no other way, Valerius charged to the front line and fought side by side with his men. Eventually, the battle started turning in Roman favor, and the Semnites flew into a complete rout. Although victorious, the Roman soldiers would admit this was the hardest fought victory of their careers. The days of fighting unorganized raiders were now over. The enemies that the Romans would face from now on would pose a far greater threat to their ambitions of empire. This victory in Campania was almost completely undone by a huge disaster in Somnium. Cornelius led his army through a narrow mountain pass. Only when the whole army entered the valley, and retreat was impossible, did they realize that the surrounding hills were occupied by the Semnites. Military tribune Publius Decius noticed an unoccupied peak near the enemy position. He led a small detachment of men and scaled the peak without being noticed. When they were in position, the Semnites realized they can't attack the Romans in the valley, as they themselves would be surrounded and unable to escape. This bought enough time for the consul and his men to safely retreat from the valley. Decius and his men were now left surrounded by angry Semnites robbed of an easy victory. Instead of engaging immediately, they decided to starve out the Romans, but this would prove to be a mistake. In the dead of night, while the Semnites were fast asleep, Decius and his men tried to sneak through their lines. 
but one of the soldiers accidentally dropped his shield on a sleeping Semnite and awoke the guards. The Romans started shouting and cutting their way through. In this confusion, Decius didn't lose a single man he led on this suicide mission. Arriving at the camp, the small detachment of men was greeted with cheering and thunderous applause. When Cornelius launched into a speech praising Decius, he was interrupted. Decius urged him to skip the formalities and attack the Semnites while they were in this state of confusion. The council agreed and the army rushed out of the camp. Most of the Semnites were still scattered around the valley, some unable to find arms to protect themselves. They were easily routed and their camp was plundered. Amidst the celebration, Decius was presented with the unprecedented two grass crowns, one from the army he rescued and one from the small detachment of men he led to safety. The grass crown was the highest honor a Roman soldier could receive. It was presented to a commander whose actions saved an entire legion or an army. The grass crown was presented by the army that was saved by the commander, which made it the rarest military honor in Rome. Seldom did the proud Roman soldiers admit that they were saved by anything other than their own courage and resolve. Furious with these defeats, the Semnites gathered all the routed forces and once more marched into Campania. Valerius, leading the whole Roman army, encamped near Suessula. They were limited by the surrounding terrain and thus built an unusually small camp. When the Semnites, by now accustomed to Roman military doctrine, approached the camp, they assumed that the force inside was fairly small. They encircled the camp and sent out foraging parties. When the Romans noticed scattered Semnites running aimlessly around the fields, they rushed out and utterly defeated the unprepared enemy. Livy reports that some 40,000 men perished on that day. With this, the first Semnite war came to a close. Returning to the city, both consuls celebrated the triumph and special honors were awarded to Decius. These victories were so notable that the Carthaginians sent a delegation to congratulate the Senate and present them with the golden crown that was placed in the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. On the request from their allies, garrisons were placed in Capua and Suessa to protect them from any further Semnite incursions. It will not shock you to learn that Livy took many creative liberties with this story. The surrender of the Capuans to the Roman Senate greatly resembles the Corcyrian debate, described in Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War, when Corcyria allied with Athens to defeat Corinth. It's unlikely that the Semnites could so utterly defeat the wealthy cities of Campania that they would have to resort to these dire measures. It's believed that the ancient historians were inspired by the events we will soon cover in this series, when Capua betrayed Rome and after a lengthy siege unconditionally surrendered. This reimagining also gave Rome a convenient excuse for breaking a treaty with Somnium. Furthermore, the events of the war seem to be largely fictional as well. They bore a great resemblance to other, more famous set pieces from later wars. Both the first and the second Semnite war start with the invasion of Somnium by a consul named Cornelius. The trapped Roman army resembles the disaster of the Caudine Forks from the Second Semnite War, and the intervention of Decius resembles the sacrifice of 300 men led by a military tribune that saved the Roman army during the First Punic War. These numerous inconsistencies led some historians to believe that the First Semnite War didn't happen at all, but current historians do agree that the war must have happened, although the extent of it is unknown. It's doubtful that any Roman historian would imagine events so unfavorable to Rome. Also, we can assume that strong Roman presence in Campania wouldn't go unnoticed by the Semnites. Having said this, we should return to our story. Soldiers wintering in Campania grew jealous of easy life on the fertile plains, and dangerous whispers began to spread throughout the garrison. Why wouldn't the brave people of Rome, who defended this land, enjoy what this land could offer them? When the consul caught wind of this, he tried to put down this rebel by transferring soldiers to Rome and other encampments. Unfortunately, this had the opposite effect. The conspirators realized they were in grave danger and assembled on the Alban Hill. Only thing they were missing now was a capable military commander. Arrogant soldiers refused to submit to any man of equal rank. During these quarrels, they heard a rumor that an old general, Titus Quinctius, retired to a farm not far from the hill. A delegation was sent to him and with a little persuasion, convinced him to lead this rebellion. Content with their new leadership, the army marched out towards Rome. They were intercepted 8 miles south of the city by Marcus Valerius Corvus, who had been nominated dictator to stop them. When the two armies met, 
Valerius refused to draw his sword against his fellow Romans. He implored them to step down and abandon this foolish cause. When Titus Quinctius then joined the dictator in condemning these acts, the soldiers snapped out of their madness and laid down their arms. Valerius requested pardon for the soldiers and not a single man was hurt in retribution. Even Livy acknowledges that the ancient sources do not agree on events that perspired after the end of the First Samnite War. Only thing they could agree with was the fact that there was a rebellion and that it was quickly subdued. When the next campaigning season started, L. Emilius Mamercus, who was consul for that year, raised an army and marched into Samnium. He encountered no resistance, so the soldiers started ravaging the fields. Samnite envoys came to him to request peace, and he referred them to the Senate. The envoys presented their demands and the Senate, weary of war, agreed to reinstate the peace treaty. With this, the army was withdrawn to Rome. The Latins and the Campanians, who had already raised their armies, felt that this treaty didn't concern them, and together they marched into Samnium. The Samnites believed this was in breach of the treaty, and requested that the Romans order their subjects to withdraw. Romans agreed to recall the Campanians, but said they had no power over the Latins, who could do as they pleased. Ramifications of this reply were twofold. Firstly, it insulted the Samnites, and secondly, it gave the Latins the idea that the Romans were scared of ordering them around. Sensing that the time was ripe to demand equal rights in the alliance, the Latins turned from Samnium and marched towards Rome. Join us next time as we discuss the Latin War and the eventual subjugation of the Latins.